I'm here to, today with Yale um, to talk about his, his medical device company. What I learned from Yale is that you can't really quantify hustle. And this guy, he really knows how to hustle, right? He is, he, he is good at it. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll uh, let Yale, the hustler Zeng, come up here and, and uh, tell you about his product. Oh, man. Thanks. Hi, right, Alvin. I, uh, I don't know. I was going to begin today talking about vital signs monitoring, but I just want to say, Alvin, everybody give him a hand for uh, his, his speech, because I don't, I don't know if I can live up to the hype that you just described, because, uh, wow. OK, anyway, so everybody, my name is Yale, and, um, and my company is called Safeheart. And I'm here to talk to you about vital signs monitoring. But before I do that, um, let me just show you what, what we make. So it's an actual product. It's called the ioximeter. It's a, it's a vital signs monitor, a pulse ox, actually, that, uh, that's powered through the headphone jack on your phone. So I'll, tell, I'll talk more about the technical details in, the, in a little bit. So let me, but first, let me begin with the story. So we came out with the first prototype uh, the first working prototype for that uh, in the, near the end of last year. And I really wanted to show everybody, wow, what a great product it was. So I took it with me to a Christmas party. Um, a lot of my friends were there, a lot of new people were there. And I passed it around and everybody wanted to try it, to get their vital signs, to, to measure their vital signs. But there was one person there um, who really uh, got a great use and, and benefited from the ioximeter. And that's Maggie. So Maggie is actually a friend of mine. Um, she's an artist and a musician. Um, and she was at the party. So when she measured her heart rate um, and her oxygen level uh, using the device, um, we found that the, the, the reading was actually extremely low, that her oxygen was in the low 90s and that her heart rate was around 47. And so she was concerned. And I, and I tried to try to make it not as serious. And I said, you know, um, I mean, maybe if you were an Olympic athlete or, or if you were asleep, you know, that's the kind of heart rate that you'd get. Um, but she was actually concerned about it. So she uh, called her doctor and made an appointment. And two weeks later, um, they, they did a full workup. And they found um, that her medication that she was taking for her insulin condition was actually causing damage to her kidneys. And that had they not caught that at that time, um, it could have led to kidney failure. So the good news is that they adjusted her medication and that she's doing a lot better now. So, and, and so she was the first person, uh, the first person that uh, had used the oximeter and actually benefited from it. And now, um, now that our product is on the market, you know, I get phone calls every week from customers who call and say that you know, they had some condition or they were using it to monitor for in some way that, uh, that they're able to benefit from it. So back to vital signs monitoring. What, what I'm going to say today is that in the future, uh, within the next few years, all of our vital signs are going to be available to us everywhere we go. Uh, and that's because the computational power of the mobile handsets that we have right now, the mobile phones that we have, <coughs> are going to be increasing exponentially. And when that happens, a lot of what used to be done in hardware uh, is going to be able to be redone in software. And so we're going to be able to have a lot of peripherals, attachments, and wearables. Um, and you've already seen that now you know, with the Nike Fuel, Fitbit, um, and other kinds of the withings. You know, other kinds of, of monitors. But what we're focused on at, uh, at Safeheart um, is we're focused on the vital signs, the ones that the doctors care about. So let me get a show of hands. How many of you have heard or have seen or know what a pulse oximeter is? OK, actually, actually a lot of people. Cool, OK. Uh, well, for the rest of you, here's a brief history lesson. So in 1972, two Japanese scientists discovered that by shining lights of two different frequencies, a red and an infrared through your finger, you're able to uh, derive the heart rate and the oxygen saturation in your blood. And that is the principle of modern oximetry. So uh, later, uh, companies such as Nelcor would come out with these devices like the N100. Um, it's great. It has a digital readout. It's got alarms that will tell you if your vitals, if the measurements are too high or too low. Well, the problem is it's 25 pounds. So it's, it's not a very uh, portable device. So, and, and that's where my, my background uh, comes into play. So I don't have a background in healthcare. I don't have a background in medicine. And my background is actually in logistics. In fact, my second startup um, called Clinical Guard is actually a medical, 
a low-cost medical devices distribution company. Um, the, the, actually, the main product that we're known for is actually a $1 um, low-priced uh, THC test you know, to see if you're, uh, you know, you've been smoking too much. All right, and uh, it's very popular in UCLA, actually. It's, uh, it's actually one of our biggest uh, customers. So anyway, so I do get customer phone calls occasionally. So in 2009, in the fall, um, that's actually a picture of the phone on my desk. Uh, I, I had a call from a customer who bought one of the um, lower end pulse oximeters that we were selling. And um, it was an elderly lady. And she said that though she liked our product, she couldn't use it because uh, her eyesight had gone bad and that she couldn't read it because the display was too small. And so I said, wow, what would you suggest as a way for us to make the results shown to you much, easily, much more easily? And she said, what if you could show the results on my phone? And I said, you mean, you mean like, like a phone oximeter? Is that what you're telling me? And she said, yes. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. So, so uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Inception, but it's, it's kind of like waking up from a dream, where I, said, I woke up and I said, wow, that's a great idea. I want to make an oximeter for the phone. So for the next three years, um, you know, I put together a team funded mostly by my own savings. Uh, to, put, to come together um, you know, across multiple continents to, uh, to, to make this device. So you know, what I wanted to talk about now are the four goals, the four founding principles of, of SafeHeart. And the first one is reducing costs. So what that means is that the, you know, over the last few decades, as we've seen, you know, the cost of healthcare has, has gone up tremendously. Um, and thanks to the Affordable, Healthcare, Affordable Care Act, um, the cost has been in control slightly, but our goal is to reduce the cost. So if you think about how you know, plasma TVs, actually that's a bad example, they're not being made anymore. Um, if you think about how LCD televisions are continuing to get much larger and the prices either stay the same or drop, you know, I thought, why can't we do that for, for medical devices? And there's no reason, there's no reason why we can't do that. Uh, the next thing is, is open access of data. So what that means is that um, before, you know, your doctor read your chart and they showed you, they told you um, with their interpretation of it. But what if you could have access to those data, that data yourself, and make informed choices and uh, make informed choices from there? The mo other important thing is that um, increased ac access and validity. So what we're doing is we're opening up all of our, all of our hardware um, to, to third-party developers, um, and we're going to allow them to create, uh, create apps that run from there. So increased access I'm sorry, increased accuracy and validity. What that means is that, so for, so for example, before, one of the problems that had um, plagued clinical trials was that the population that they studied on was homogenous, which means that um, the results that they derived might have been skewed because of the small study set. Now, because of, the, because of the deployment of our device and the fact that the app can gather information from every single user, we're able to have much finer granularity when it comes to the data so that we can make much more intuitive and educated guesses as to um, the trend. Uh, so for example, um, we can use it to study where uh, if someone is living downstream from a power station, is their oxygen level going to be lower because of that? Now we can actually test that by deploying these devices out in the field. So the last thing, like I said, was the, was the app ecosystem. Well, uh, unlike some wearable comp companies that make their devices, Ours is going to be open. So we're going to create an open API where you can export all of the data, and you can actually access and activate the hardware and integrate the data into whatever you're working on. So, so you know, we want to be creative, but I know that there's a lot more people, especially people in this room who are extremely creative, who are already having ideas on what they want to do with this device. So now talking more about the past. It's, uh, there's an old Chinese proverb. I know you've heard of it. It's probably been used to death. It's called, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. Well, for us, it was actually a journey of tens of thousands of miles. Uh, and the reason for that is because, well, when we first came out with it, uh, I'm sorry to say that. When we first came out with the device, it was made for iPhone only. Um, we made it using, we came out with a solution that used the 30 pin. Um, and during that time, uh, Apple said, no, we're going to switch everybody to the lightning jack. So. We contacted Apple, and uh, they, they said, oh, yeah, you can use the lightning jack, but we're going to need to give us this much money to license it, and you need to pay us for every single device that you use the lightning jack for. And I said, well, 
you know, our goal is to reduce the cost of, of these devices. So how, so how are we going to reduce that if we were paying a tax to use that plug? So I said, uh, maybe we could do something else. And so I said, well, let's, let's use the headphone jack instead. Because up until now, every single phone has a headphone jack. And for the foreseeable future, they probably will have headphone jacks. And the best part about that is now we can have a cross-platform device. So, uh, so that seems like a simple idea, but actually it set us back an entire year because now that we, because there's a limited amount of power that's coming from the headphone jack, we had to make two breakthroughs, uh, one in power consumption. So the original device that we came out with used 120 milliwatts, and the new device that we have today uses only eight milliwatts. So we reduced the power consumption by over 95%. Um, the, the other uh, innovation that we made was in data compression. So if you use a, a square or other kind of credit card swipe, the data rate for that is of only about 1K. Um, through compression technology that we developed, we are sending data back at about 20K, to the, back to the phone. So that's why now we have a device that works uh, both on Apple and uh, on Android. So that's, uh, I didn't want to infringe any trademarks. So, so, we're, so we're using that picture. Um, OK. So during the development of, of our product, um, something else happened. Um, it's the quantified self movement. So you know, starting with companies like the Fitbit, um, you know, they're creating devices that are used to measure everything about you. You know, how many steps you're taking per day, how much, how for, how far did you run, how many left turns you made when you're on the highway. You know, those things are are, are good, and you know. In fact, if you take a look at the, the two images here, that, those, that's actually a map of all the friends that I have on Facebook. Uh, and so that's part of Quantify Itself. And we want to contribute to the Quantify Itself movement by creating um, actual s devices that monitor the vital signs, and the same vital signs that doctors have been using for decades um, in their treatment of actual health conditions. So, so we can contribute to, the, in addition, new measurements that can be taken while you are going about your everyday lives. Hold on. OK. Now, we're a small startup. And I, like I said earlier, it was, it was mostly self-funded. So we don't have a huge marketing campaign. Um, but we did try to do some viral marketing. And so here is one of our viral ads that we released uh, last Christmas. Honey. Yeah, babe. Do you want to have some fun? Wait. I just want to be safe. OK, I'm ready. OK, uh, it is a little bit risque. And, uh, and believe me, there was, a, there was a huge backlash from the, uh, the nursing community. Um, <laughs> telling us not to, not to advocate unsafe acts uh, at home. So, uh, but the good news is, I mean, we have over 30,000 hits. Uh, it seems to be pretty popular. And the people who are forwarding it mostly are people in healthcare. So I think, uh, I think it comes, you know, the message comes across is that, you know, you know unconventional thinking in developing these products, it's, uh, we want to put that message out there in just, in not just our product, but also in our ads. So, let me tell you what I like about the Ioximeter. Um, well, if you take a look at the exterior design and it, you know, up here, it's actually designed by my friend Simon Lee. Um, he was uh, actually a uh, friend of mine from college. Um, his background is industrial design, um, but he's all mainly known for bathroom fixtures, which is great because uh, you would take a look at this and, you, and it doesn't look like a medical device. It wouldn't be out of place uh, on your coffee table. So what else do I like about it? We don't have any proprietary ports which means that, uh, that you can work, use it with most phones. Uh, and the other thing is that when you use it with a different operating system, if you want to switch out phones, you're always going to have a headphone jack. And you know, I do a fair amount of traveling. And the last thing that I want to do is carry a charger with me, uh, you know, a bunch of chargers, a bunch of cables with me everywhere I go. Well, with the oximeter, because it's powered from the headphone jack, you don't have to worry about that. You just have one device, you plug it in, and it just works. And so back to what I was saying earlier, this is how pulse oximeters used to look. 
And this is how the Axe Summary looks now. So I'm going to give a quick demo. All right, so my friend Lauren is going to come over here and show you how this works. All right, so what I have here is a, is a S5. Um, but you can also use it on the phones that are produced by the other company. All right, so uh, what we have here is the Oximeter app. It started. And uh, OK. Are you ready? I think right. so. My heart's right. beating a little faster. All right, all right. <laughs> so OK, so just uh, I'm going to try to show you right here. OK, so basically, um, the Oximeter app, um, it's available on the Play Store um, and the App Store. Um, you know, it's, it's gathering the measurements right now. It's, this is what's known as a plethysmograph. And it's actually a chart uh, of the heartbeat. So Lauren's a very good friend of mine. Uh, she actually came down here from Atlanta to, uh, to help support me on, the, on this talk right here. Um, but she's also the person who uh, told me about Maggie earlier, who, you know, who introduced me and Maggie, and also uh, Albin and everyone else in this room. So she's a great social connector. She's also involved in a, in a kickball league, and we're on the same team. So, all right, so, that's, so th that's the story there. Uh, OK, good. So we have the measurements now. So uh, what you're looking at is actually a new version of the app that's not available in the store, but we're going to be releasing this week. There's actually two functions that are new here. So what we have here on the upper left-hand side, the oxygen saturation. Uh, on the upper right-hand side is the heart rate. So, uh, so it's actually dropped significantly from when we started measuring. So are you, doing, are you doing that meditation breathing? OK. All right. So the next thing is uh, on the lower left-hand side is perfusion index. And that's a measurement of the strength of your pulse. And on the right hand, lower right hand side is a brand new measurement too. It's a respiration rate. And, these, and this is an, an improvement from the app version that we just had just a few, just a few months ago. Um, so here's some other functions that I'm going to show just very quickly. Uh, there's a chart right here that you can use to zoom in and look at the, re the results. Uh, there's a summary that you can use to, uh, to look at all the measurements. And then there's a settings right here where you can set the alarms for when the values are too high or too low. All right. And then, OK, so now Lauren's going to just walk around the audience and show everybody the device. OK. All right. Yeah, originally, we were scheduled to have an Elmo projector, but uh, it didn't happen. So we're going to improvise. All right. So what you saw on the app was it had the heart rate and the oxygen saturation. It had alarms to tell you when the heart rate was, was you know, too high or too low when the values are too high or too low. It's got recording and the ability to uh, chart your results over time. Uh, we're actually working on an exciting project um, with Wolfram Research where we're going to be able to export to their new programming cloud. You heard it here first. All right, and then the, uh, the uh, new functionality is the respiration rate and the perfusion index. So, so, so new functionality that came out for this app. This app is free. Um, all you have to do is buy the hardware. And we're continuing to develop new function for it. We're going to release new updates for it every few months. So, what would, so one of the things you're going to ask, well, how am I going to make money on this thing? Why would I continue to make new features for it? Well, one of the biggest inspirations for me was actually a company called uh, Nest. So two years ago, uh, my air conditioner broke. And as a part of that new system uh, that I got, I also got one of these thermostats. And I only had to buy it once. But through the two years that I've been using it, the, the, its function has improved. And they have continued to come out with new features for it. And that's really been a big inspiration for me, where we're going to make a device that you, can only, you only have to buy once. You don't have to keep buying a new version of it every single year. You just buy it once, and we're going to continue making new functionality and new updates for it. So you know, and, and, the, and, it's, it's, and here's an analogy that I'll give. Um, and, and it might be too, and it might be an analogy that might be too, might be too uh, old for some of you in the audience. So when I was younger, I remember watching a movie called the uh, called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And, and and part of it, when they made the factory tour, uh, there was a candy called the Everlasting Gobstopper. And uh, one of the parents from you know that was on a tour said, uh, "Well, if everybody has one of these, aren't you going to stop selling candy?" Well, that's fine, because we're going to do something else. We're going to make other cool things. All right. So what was the, ins what was the inspiration for that? And, and, and why are we doing it an unconventional way? Well, as I said, um, my background is not in healthcare. It's not in medicine. 
um, is actually in shipping. So one of the greatest, one of the other inspirations for me was actually a guy by the name of Malcolm McLean. Um, he was a person in 1934. Um, he bought a second-hand truck for $120, and over the next 20 years, he was able to build uh, a, a trucking empire that was that became the fifth largest trucking company in the U.S. But he wasn't done yet. He wasn't done yet. At the time, uh, the law forbid someone who had a trucking company from owning a ocean shipping company. But he had a really, a really good idea. So, at, so before his idea, when you needed to ship something from, let's say, uh, New Jersey to to Miami, um, you could either use trucks or you could have pay longshoremen to load things piecemeal into a cargo ship. Well, his thought was that why don't we have cargo ships using a standard container? So he took, it took a decade of his life, but he was able to convince every single shipping company to switch to a standardized 40-foot container. And by doing so, he was able to reduce the labor costs. Um, he was also able to reduce theft, and, we, and he was also able to reduce the time that it took to load things, and also ultimately the cost. So he reduced the sh cost of shipping a ton of freight from $5.18 down to $16 per ton. Uh, sorry, 16 cents per ton, a 97% decrease in cost. And so that's why every day, every day now, we're benefiting from that because we're getting everything shipped in here from, from China via container ships at a very inexpensive price. So back to the drawing board. We came up with the oximeter, and now that you've seen it working, you know, you're going to think, wow, it's really cool. I want one, right? I thought so, too. I thought so, too. So, so uh, we came up with the product. Um, we went around to retailers. We explained to them, you know, this is how the device works, uh, and this is why you should carry it. Well, the first question that major retailers, like Walmart, told me, what, asked me was, why would anybody want a pulse oximeter on their phone? And, and my thought was, was why not? <laughs> so, uh, so rather than sitting there in their office and trying to convince them otherwise, I just, we decided to go a different route. And that's why Alvin's here today to make that introduction. Um, last year, we, you know, we, uh, last year, in the middle of last year, I suddenly discovered a thing called crowdfunding. And I said, wow, isn't that a great way to, to sell products? So even though we already had a uh, product working, um, nobody knew about us. So through a fortunate series of events, we entered into a, the Insert Coin contest over at Engadget. Um, they selected us as one of the products um, to go out to their show in New York. And, and after that, we launched our crowdfunding campaign. Um, and I will tell you this. I am not a social media guy. I barely use Twitter. In fact, I only sent one tweet my whole life before then. So, so uh, there were a lot of things that I didn't know. So that's why, that's why Albin, uh, who I have uh, hence called the crowd whisperer, uh, was, uh, was, a key to, was a big part of our success. Although I didn't listen to all the, all the advice that he gave, and we probably would have uh, you know, funded a lot more uh, had, had I uh, taken all the careful steps and planning that we've done. But regardless, um, we had a 60-day campaign. We, the goal was $10,000. Um, we raised a little bit over that, and we were able to pre-sell 188 devices. So, so that's the good news. Uh, so the campaign ended. We had this money. And I thought, wow, this is cool. We're going to go make this product now. Wrong. OK. <laughs> I, uh, I have never, we've never manufactured anything before. I don't have a background in manufacturing. So I, we ran into a bunch of different challenges. The first one, communication. Well, when someone backs a campaign uh, on Kickstarter or any other kind of crowdfunding platform, um, they're personally vested in this product. So you know, it's important to make that person you know, feel uh, important. It's important to, to make them happy. And you know, I t undertook, uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that they were happy. And the important thing to do that is if you encounter snags or production problems along the way or setbacks, that you would tell them about that. Not what we did. Not what we did. So, uh, so that's an important lesson. The second thing was, was, was manufacturing. Um, did you know that, the, you know, according to Pantone, there's over a thousand different shades of white for plastic? Uh, you know, we ran into, you know, when we were making the printed circuit boards, 
We had a problem where it wouldn't fit. We had, we had to figure out new adhesives to use that wouldn't melt the plastic and would also be strong enough so that you could use it for years without having to break the device. Um, and you know, just there's a host of issues that we wouldn't know until we actually started making things. So there's a huge difference between a prototype and an actual finished commercialized product. And finally, shipping. Well, uh, I'm standing on stage today, but to let you know this, did you know that after the New Year is over, there's an additional separate Chinese New Year? Because uh, that, that's, that's important to me. So, so once we had made the devices and they were sitting on the dock, you know, ready to be shipped out, uh, Chinese New Year happened. And so for two weeks, uh, everybody took a holiday in China and nothing was, was coming in or going out. So, I, so we were sitting here with angry voicemails, emails, and even a, hand, and even a carefully written handwritten letter from one of our backers uh, you know, asking where their product was. And there was nothing that we could do about that. So it's important to plan ahead and set realistic uh, timelines for when you're going to deliver the product. And so, so, but the thing is, there are important lessons that we did learn, though, and things that really helped us. Um, so first is, is getting the word out early. So um, next time we run a campaign, or we come out with some, some new product, we're going to listen to Albin's advice. We're going to you know, start several months before, talk to the right people, get the, get the PR machine working, and then just get the word out there. Um, you know, it's, it's not about making a great product. For great products, yes, and you think great products will sell themselves, but it's really about marketing. Um, and you might, you, know, you might know that since you know, there's a lot of marketing dollars being spent um, on products that you buy right now. Next thing is talk to anyone, everyone. And, and you know, that's, that's the thing. And, that's, and I actually want to thank Ben, who's in the audience today, uh, about that. Because uh, when, uh, when, when Ben was in town in, on Easter, uh, he needed a ride to the airport. And he said, can anybody give me a ride? And I said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll step up and, uh, and, and drive, drive him down to the airport. And then he said, um, so during the ride down there, you know, he asked me what I was working on. I said, oh, I came out with this oximeter. He said, wow, that's a really cool product. You should come down and do a talk at Google. And so, so that's why I'm here today. <laughs> so that's just one of the examples. But you know, you know, everyone I've spoken to, you know, even if they're not in, uh, don't have the same background as us, or they're not in our industry, they've been able to offer um, you know, new perspectives and given us great insights to make improvements to our product, um, to our app and also to the way that we're marketing and selling these devices. So it's, it's always important to talk to everyone um, who you know or you don't know about what you're working on. Don't keep your ideas a secret. Uh, the next one is build a group of super fans. So um, how, many of know, how many of you know who that guy is? OK. All right, he's, uh, he's Stephen Wolfram. He's actually the creator of Mathematica and, and Wolfram Alpha. Um, he actually came by our booth, um, and he saw our product. And I showed it to him, he said, Wow, that's really interesting. The next day, somebody from that company called us and said that, yes, we want you to work, want your device to be sending data to the Wolfram computing platform. I was like, wow, that's really? <laughs> so so, it's, uh, so it, you know, it's not just him, but you know, through crowdfunding um, this product, we were able to develop a core base of what I would call super fans, you know, 20 or 30 people who you know, we give access, early access to our app, who can help us you know, find out uh, you know, to give us feedback, and, and uh, you know, as they're using the app during, during their day-to-day -day activities, and uh, they've helped us improve the performance and the functionality greatly. Um, and that's that's the that's the other uh, benefit <laughs> that we've gotten from from crowdfunding. So, who are our primary customers now? Well, we have you know pilots who are uh, general aviation pilots who may be flying in uncompressed cabin aircrafts. Uh, and they're looking to avoid uh, hypoxia, and also high altitude climbers um, who also want to avoid hypoxia, and also uh, people who are, uh, you know, professionals who are interested, uh, young people who are interested in monitoring every aspect of their health, um, you know, as they as they are, you know, want to improve their fitness or just to go about their uh, daily lives. And so this uh, this picture I'm actually most proud of. Uh, it's an image of every single iteration of our device from the first version to the current version. So as you see, there are 13 different designs. Uh, there's actually a black one. 
Yeah, that was a one-off, because uh, I was thinking maybe we could do a black one with like a red chord, and then have it called like the Heartbeats edition. Don't know if uh, Dre would like that. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that, that didn't happen. Um, but that's where we are. We are manufacturing and selling this device. Um, we've signed up uh, two major distribution deals with um, the, uh, the two largest uh, pilot uh, and aviation catalogs in this country, Sporties and Pilot Mall. And we're also continuing to sign new distributors every week. So this is where I'd like to talk about the next exciting thing, uh, which is our partnership. So right when, you told, when I told you earlier that all the vital signs would be available to you in your future, well, there's a team in uh, Oxford University uh, headed by uh, Dr. Gary Clifford, uh, and who has been working on this for many years. So, so while we were busy working on the ioximeter, they have been working on a host of other devices. And so I'm glad to announce a partnership with Professor Clifford where he will, he will be able to offer um, the expertise and the knowledge and also the technology that their team has developed. Um, and here's just one example. So the blood pressure team right now consists of five guys, uh, Mauro, Marco, Carlos, Yoao, and Ali. And they're from all over the world. Um, they're working in a laboratory in the UK right now on blood pressure. And, and they're working on something that's very, very extraordinary. Um, but before I show you what that is, here's a quote from, from Professor Clifford. So he, say, he says that you know, we are aiming to slash the cost of healthcare equipment and transform the landscape of competition into the service delivery and software sector. This partnership with SafeHeart will accelerate our time to impact and allow us to focus on improving and designing new technologies. He's basically saying that, that we're on the same page, that we both want to create affordable, low-cost devices for everyone in the world, not just people here in, you know, who, in this office or in this building, uh, but everywhere. So one of the, things, one of the first problems that we're going to tackle is, is actually blood pressure. So um, as, as you may know, um, you know as, as people from the baby boomer generation get older, um, and as people's, you know, the uh, quality of life uh, increases, um, one of the side effects of that is uh, increasing the number of people who have high blood pressure. Well, there are blood pressure monitors that you can buy right now. You can go to CVS and get one. But this, is a, this, this new device that they're working on is going to be uh, much better in many ways. So, if you take a look, that's a picture of the current design. It's a small circuit board. It's a USB adapter that fits on your phone, and it can fit inside of a Tic Tac box. And what that makes is this device. It's a, it's a hand-pumped blood pressure monitor that you can attach to your phone. And why are we using a hand pump? Well, there are motor-based uh, blood pressure monitors out there, but they're actually fairly inaccurate. So by using a hand pump uh, as in a sphygma manometer, Wait, yes, that's right, uh, gamification, that's what it's all about. So, so, so they made it into a, kind of a game. Um, but by, by using a hand pump, we're actually able to increase the resolution uh, and accuracy by a factor of, of three. So this is what we envision the final product to look like. Um, and the best part is we're going to be able to uh, have the product available very soon. Um, now, currently, you can buy a smartphone-based high uh, blood pressure monitor. They are out there on the market. And the prices generally start from anywhere between $60 to $120. But this device is going to be retailing for less than, 20, less than $30. So what next? Well, one of the problems that still concern developing countries is infant mortality. Um, and it's mainly because of a lack of healthcare workers, a lack of facilities, and proper prenatal care. Well, one of the products that we're going to be working on now is what's known as a fetal Doppler. So, you know, from this early prototype, we're going to make a smartphone based ultrasound uh, Doppler that uh, expectant mothers can use. And it's going to look something like this, where you can uh, just put it on the stomach. It'll measure the heart rate of the unborn child, and it'll display it on the screen. And you can also record a 10-second audio clip so that you can send it to your doctor or grandma or Instagram. So whatever. <laughs> OK. And, the, uh, and we expect the retail price for this device to be less than $50. 
So what I'm saying is that you know, we're working on a lot of, a lot of great technologies. And, and through our partnership, we're going to come out with a lot of cool things. So we, we're going to make a spirometer. We're going to make an ECG. And basically what I'm saying is that we're, what we want to do is we want to turn this, which you see in hospitals, into this, where it's a, a device, a host of devices that can attach to your tablet or your phone, where all of your vital signs will be available to you at your fingertips everywhere you go. Now, I'm not the only person, and we're not the only team around the world working on these devices. You know, there's dozens, if not hundreds, of teams around other research universities trying to do the same thing. And it's good. It actually creates a market for this product. But there's one more thing I want to talk about. And it's, it's, it's in partnership with uh, Professor Clifford. It's the buy one, give one program. So starting today until the end of October, every single ioximeter that we sell on our official website, for every single one, we are going to give one to a charity organization in the third world. Or uh, you can also select a charity in the US that would like to use one of these devices. So everyone would be able to benefit. So that's why I want to re leave you with these final thoughts. Um, you know, we're the four tenets of SafeHeart and also our partnership um, with Oxford Center for Affordable Healthcare. It's to reduce costs so that everyone can have access to the latest technology without having to pay hundreds of dollars for them. To open the access of the data so that everyone can make informed decisions about their own healthcare. Um, to increase the accuracy and validity through new analytics that we're developing based off of the data set that we're going to gather from these, these devices and from these apps. And finally, to create an ecosystem of new apps. So I'm sure some of you here are interested in, uh, in you know, trying this device out and seeing if you want to make, you know, remix it and make something cool for, and new for it. Talk to me after the, uh, after the talk. OK. So now I just want to give a thanks to our team. Uh, Simon, who I talked about earlier, who did the exterior design. Uh, Alvin, who did the PCB. Um, Herbert, who was instrumental in creating our apps. So unlike some companies who came out with their device for the, the iPhone first, we were able to come out with the app for both iPhone and Android simultaneously. Um, and then finally, Jera, who's uh, responsible for developing our user interface, our website, and also our packaging. And then also, I just want to thank uh, Maggie and Dave for, uh, for, for letting me use their story. Um, it, was, it, was very, uh, it, was, it was something that really resonated with myself. Because, because to see someone who can benefit from something that you created, something that changed their lives and improved it for the better, you know, that's the most rewarding part about what I do. So, uh, but you did forget for, to mention your target market, the, the adventurous couples, right? <laughs> you didn't mention those. So I, the, I, I think that was, uh, I think people already got that from looking at the viral video. Right, right, so I think. Right. Uh, so the first question I had for you when I, when I met you was, so this is basically a, a pulse oximeter, right? And it, it almost seems too obvious to connect to the phone. And I think you had a pretty good explanation or, or pretty good argument of why, why that wasn't necessarily so. Well, uh, actually, if you think about it this way, um, one, of, one of the, you know, you would think that having a pulse oximeter on your phone is a pretty obvious idea. And it is, it is. But let me tell you a story about another really obvious idea. Okay, so in 1980, uh, Procter & Gamble had a huge problem. They needed to create a new cleaning device. They wanted, they, they wanted a new cleaning technology that would, that would save people time. So their internal team developed a more absorbent mop. When they put it out in the test market, the problem was they found that people were spending 80% of their time cleaning the mop rather than cleaning the floor. So they hired an outside company called Continuum Research. Continuum Research spent another three or four years, hundreds of hours, videotaping people while they were cleaning. They were doing studies, they were taking pictures, and they still couldn't come up with a new idea until the leader of the team, Howard, he said, he, in a frustrated, exasperated sigh, he said, why don't we just track dirt into people's homes and see what they did? So it was during one of these visits that an elderly lady, just like the elderly lady that, uh, that 
you know, that, that called in one day and gave me the idea for the eye oximeter. An elderly lady saw that they had tracked coffee grounds into, onto her floor. So she went to her kitchen, took a paper towel, dabbed it with some water, bent down, and wiped the floor. And when Howard saw the video, he said, well, I must have done that hundreds of times. I must have done that hundreds of times. What if I created a paper towel that I could put at the end of a stick and then I could use it to clean my floor. And then at the end of it, I could just throw that paper towel away. Oh, well, that became the Swiffer. So, so nowadays, it's a $500 million a year product for P&G. And if you think about it, a paper towel at the end of a stick, that's a pretty obvious idea. But until someone comes up with that, though, you know, it's not been invented. I like it. So, so, so uh, tell me about, you said you're, you're sharing data, right? You're making it public. So I know there are lots of rules and regulations about how you can uh, access and share this data. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how you're going around those rules? OK, well, the important thing is that when you're talking about uh, information about uh, health and vital signs, such as HIPAA. Just tell them. OK, when you're, <laughs> when you're talking about uh, you know, guidelines such as HIPAA, one of the requirements is that the information has to be private. Well, if you are using this device on an opt-in basis, and you are selecting to share this data with uh, whoever, then, then you are actually in compliance with the law. But more importantly, when the data is stored on the phone, it's stored in a, on an encrypted database so that, so, that you, so that third parties cannot access to it unless they are given permission. And what, what are some of the uses that you can see for making this data public? Well, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that we can uh, make educated guesses and actually studies about, um, about conditions that people live in and also have gathered more data about that. So for example, um, let's say I live downstream from a coal-fired power plant. Um, is my breathing affected by that? Well, um, I, we, if there's a significant population base who's using this device, or we deploy this oximeter um, in that population, then we can actually measure their performance uh, over time to see if that's affected. So that, and also, for example, with the fetal Dopplers, um, that were, the ultrasound Dopplers that we're developing, we're going to be able to say, you know, does the sleeping pattern of the, of the mother or their stress levels impact the health of the baby? Now we're going to be able to gather information on a, on a much more larger scale. Gotcha. So what are some of the other, uh, you showed us uh, a few products, but are there any other products that, that you're currently working on? Uh, yes, well, you've them? seen all the other products uh, that, that we've, uh, we've come up with, but one of the things that we want to do is create an information hub where all of these devices can be plugged into so that they can measure your, all the vital signs simultaneously. And then it'll be syncing to your tablet PC wirelessly. So that that's, would be the ultimate goal, a, a patient monitor that you can use at home on your bedside, on your bedstand. All right. So and I think you've shared your prices and you've shared, shared basically everything you're doing. Are you not afraid that, that other people are now, now have a, basically a, a benchmark that they, need, that they need to beat before releasing their product? Well, I mean, this talk is going to be on YouTube. So the ideas that I talked about today are going to be out there. But the way I feel about it is that we don't, we don't have to be, you know, we don't have to be the ones that make all the money. I mean, if someone comes out with something like ours that's, that's just as easy to use and, and it's less expensive, they should do that. They should take these ideas and make it so that, it, that in the end, it benefits the, wide, the great public, where everyone can have access to it. So one of the inspirations for me was actually um, Elon Musk, who recently talked right. about releasing the patents to the Tesla motor car um, to other automotive competitors, so that the proliferation of electrical car technology is, is going to increase. And speaking of Tesla, one of my greatest inspirations, and somebody, fr somebody from where you, are you? Somebody from your, your country, right, right. Nikola Tesla, he gave, he gave all the patents away that he right. worked on just so that we would have things like AC power and induction motors. So I feel that, so, so they, they, can, they can knock off our products, they can copy our designs, it doesn't matter. As long as more people have access to greater technologies at an inexpensive price that they can use to improve their, their, their end results overall. Okay. Is an iPhone getting rid of the headphone jack? You know, I was, I, was a, I was thinking someone was going to ask that question. Yeah, so there have been uh, rumors, um, and I've seen that um, there had been some um, intellectual property um, filings 
um, stating that they're going to be developing a digital audio converter that uses the lightning jack. So with their recent acquisition of uh, Beats by Dre, then it's possible that in the future they're going to get rid of the headphone jack. So when that happens, though, we already have plan B, which has always been plan B from the beginning, which is Bluetooth. Um, I personally don't like Bluetooth because that means you have to bring another charger with you. And that's just another thing that you have to, have to carry around with you. But um, Bluetooth is going to be a, uh, an alternative that we're going to use um, if, if it comes down to that where we can no longer use the headphone jack. You mentioned earlier in the talk that um, your team had developed some breakthrough technology and profession to, uh, to increase transfer rates. Is yes. that something you guys have published about? And what are your general thoughts on that? Um, actually, the, the, um, we're, gonna, we're making that information public. Um, it's mainly uh, has to do with time division. So um, just think about how, um, I don't know how old everyone is in this room, but uh, a long time ago when you wanted to go online, you had to use what's known as a modem through your phone. And so we had, we had what's called dial-up. And, uh, and so, we're, so we, were using, we were using time division, which is which similar to what uh, modems use to, uh, to compress the data and send it back to the phone. So you mentioned that you've reduced the power consumption by 90-something percent, right? That's right. That's right. Um, so like, tell us a little bit about that. Like, what, did you, what did you do to reduce the power consumption so much? OK, uh, that's a good question. Um, that's, that's part of, that's a, I'm going to give away a little bit of our secret sauce right here. Because that's because that's we didn't even file it. We didn't even file a patent for that. But uh, what we've done is we took the circuit board. We identified which components need absolutely needed power and which ones did not. And so, well, as you're using the oximeter, even though the light is on all the time, the rest of the circuit board is actually turning on and off, ten times per second. So we have a ten hertz on-off cycle, where we actually use capacitors to charge it up, charge it up, and then power and then turn on the board, the entire board, only briefly, you know, once every you know, 10 times per second, and then we turn it off again, so that you can sip the power as opposed to going you know, full power all the time. OK, well, I just want to, uh, once again, I just want to tell everyone, it's, uh, my name's Yale, and that's me uh, in the corner. Uh, that this is Albin. Um, Lauren was the one who uh, helped just demo the app for everyone. Uh, Maggie and Dave, um, it was their story uh, in the beginning that it, uh, really impacted me. Um, and also, if you use the coupon code Google, you can get 20% off when you buy an oximeter. And, and like I said, you know, there, you know, it's it's fortunate that I'm here to give a talk today. But there are many other companies um, that are making devices similar to us, to ours. So, so prepare to see a lot more vital signs based, you know, monitoring devices uh, showing up in the marketplace in the future. <laughs>